So then we'll start. Like, yay! Yay! yay. yay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Oh, we are um, we are the right talk, um, and we're here with Nicole. Woo I need to. <laughs> Video. It's weird. Okay. Um, and so we are going to talk about world building tonight. Yep. Super excited. Um, and also scary. Yeah, scary. Um, <laughs> so I am Latija. Um, I write urban fantasy most of the time. I just started dabbling in romance. So we'll see how that goes. Um, if you really well. connect with me. I am on IG. You can see my little handle down there. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Sheena next to me. Um, my name is Sheena. I write urban fantasy and dark fantasy. Um, my IG is Writer's Crush, and I am so happy to be here. You need to buy um, Mrs. Words Can Sing's two books because it's amazing. Go ahead. Oh, I'm it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm minor edit. That's my IG. Also in the corner, I write predominantly high fantasy and a story. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have the wonderful Nicole here with us. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> hey, no problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Nicole Givens Kurtz, and I write um, weird westerns, science fiction, um, pulp noir, and fantasy mysteries. I am also the owner for Mocha Memoirs Press, which is a small press in South Carolina that publishes marginalized voices in um, speculative fiction. Look at you out here being impressed with yourself. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I was like, oh. Got to be succinct. <laughs> like, where can they, where, did you give them your website? Uh, like no, actually, my Twitter handle is there at, uh, at Nicole G. Kurtz. Um, you can find me at com um, or Facebook at Nicole G. Kurtz. Yeah. I don't have any, we do have an Instagram for Mocha Memoirs, and I believe it's Mocha Memoirs. That's the handle. Ooh. It's mm. lots of great books on the site. Mm. We, we've gotten a couple of them. Going broke. <laughs> <laughs> Going broke. For real. Though. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we can jump right in with the questions mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. Um, so what is your experience with world building? What do you like, dislike about it? Um, yeah. So I have right now I currently have four series. Uh, one is my Civil Lewis series, which is the Cyber punk noir uh think blade runner with a black female lead in post-apocalyptic dc um then i have my minister knights of souls series which takes place in a galaxy far far away um on an ice planet where it's more space opera slash fantasy um and then i have my recent series uh the kingdom of avis which is um fantasy mystery but the fantasy element or world building is around an avian culture so lots of birds <laughs> so um in the fourth one which i kind of retired but i might bring out is um my candidate series which is set in a futuristic uh united states um think uh elysium um plus um oblivion like it's just a really crazy futuristic wasteland type of series and so all of them required a great deal of world building and so uh, I was it, it required a lot of creation because none of them take place in the now <laughs> they all take place in the future or in some other place like the kingdom of Avis or the Pixlist galaxy and so one of the things about world building that I that originally when I started with like the Minister Knights of Souls and with the Civil Lewis series, I used to just take notes. I used to just take notes and put them on, and I had like millions of lists, and I did not like world building. It was just a necessary evil to get to the story. <laughs> and and I hated it because I, I didn't know anything about a world, I didn't know anything about a Bible, a world Bible, didn't know anything about that. I just had uh, a fat drive in my tower to let you know how long ago it was full of uh word documents with lists um 
And so I knew enough to like write down my character information. I knew enough about general how the world worked. I just wrote all that stuff down and I hated it. I just absolutely abhorred it. Um, but one of the things that I have learned the longer I've done this and one of the things that I love about world building, what I love about the internet um, is when I was, <clears throat> one of the questions you guys asked is, do I build from the story in or from the world out, right? And so uh, originally I used to just write this, the world building was part of, it was a means to an end, get to the story. Um, but with the Kingdom of Avis, I actually sat down and built the world. And that was a much more fulfilling thing for me than I had anticipated as a writer. I feel like I like grew up or passed the grade or something. I'm like, oh, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> um, and so what I did was uh, with world building was I took, um, and it is, and I think primarily it was because I didn't really I had a story I had like the first two sentences of a story, but what intrigued me most was the world was the kingdom of Avis right. I wanted to write something light. I wanted to write something fun because of the really dark and depressing, challenging like reality that we're living in right now. And so I was like, I want to write something fun and short and fast, but I want it to be like light. And you're like, Nicole, the title of that book is Kill Three Birds. How is it light? Um, <laughs> but it is because the Kingdom of Avis is about birds and it's about, um, I spend a lot of time looking at art on art station, right? I spend a lot of time looking at um, ambiance videos on YouTube um, to get a feel for the type of settings I wanted uh, for the story. Um, I have like a visual, I have like a visual uh, blog tour <laughs> of uh, the city of gold. Like I just, I, I spent a lot of time being immersed in how that city works, how the, the order is structured, what birds, what behavior does those, do those birds have? How is it governed? right? Like I spend a lot of time looking at how they pay for things, who has power, who doesn't, who's in charge of regulating things, right? And so I, I spend a lot of time like looking at our world and envisioning what it would look like if everybody was a bird. Honestly, it sounds like a good story. <laughs> it's fantastic and I'm not just saying it because I wrote it um you, you know, first said it I was like Ooh, what is that one <laughs> it's, know, like, right? it's kill three birds right it's the kingdom of Avis and so I love it like love it like I mostly most of the things I write have a strong suspense element or they're mysteries right like Civil Lewis is a PI in the future right there's a strong thrilling um for Minister Knights of Souls, it's it's always a mystery. There's a mystery to solve or who can you trust type of Game of Thrones-ish um, feel to it. Same thing with the Candidate series. Who can you trust? There's a resistance. There's a governing, there's a corporate entity that controls the world and then there's a resistance. So there's like a suspense for who can you trust? Can we actually defeat them? Who's betrayed us? So there's a lot of suspense, thriller type of feel in all of my books. Um, but Kill Three Birds, you have Hawk uh, Prentice is the, and so, okay, in Kill Three Birds, in the world, they are, the world is set up that all the providences or states are named after, <clears throat> after black birders, all right, and all the eggs or cities are named after white birders or bird scientist whose name I can't think of right now what they're called um, and so I spent a lot of time researching um, black birders um, like the city the capital the capital providence is Lanham after Dr. Lanham who works at Clemson University he's like one of the only or few black uh, doctors of bird um, studies and so I spent a lot of time like digging around and being very purposeful in the naming of cities and naming of, of mountain ranges um, they all have to do with people, you know, um, who are connected to or scientists that were connected to birds um, and the study of birds. So there's a lot of things like that. <laughs> I also like punts. And so like there are things like um, bird song is how they pay for stuff. That's their currency, right? Um, the greeting for each other is hoot. Hoot, wow. hello. Um, so there's lots of things like that. Um, but princes, and so the, the order is the governing body, think like the Vatican, 
right? It's actually modeled after the Vatican, that world building piece. And so you have the owl, which is like the Pope, and then you have cardinals, falcons, you know, um, hawks, which what Prentice is, and then you have condors. And so Prentice is a hawk because hawks have really great eyesight. She can see the unseen. That's so one of your questions is about magic. So um, hawks can see the unseen because they have magic in their bloodline passed down through their mothers um, where they can see things beyond what the normal human eye can see. The drawback to that is that the more the hawk uses that ability, they will eventually go blind. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> so it, so in the kingdom of Avis, magic has a consequence. Like if you're earth mage, there's a consequence. If you're a blood mage, there's a consequence. And so they all have like, like their magic has a, has a drawback. There's a drawback to it. And the whole society is matrilineal. Wow. Okay. That is so <laughs> Because most birds, right, the males have to perform to get the female, the woman, the female and the species is the, the dominating personality in many instances. And so um, a lot of the bird behavior, which is part of the world building too, is incorporated into how they behave. Um, case in point, the roosters in my story. So uh, there are eggs, which are cities. And so that's where... <clears throat> Those that live in eggs. <laughs> when you say uh, eggs, is it just called eggs? Yes. Envision. Okay. <laughs> it's just it's called an egg. Instead of cities, they're called eggs. Okay. Because eggs are a nest, and that's what states and providences are called. Okay. <laughs> and you guys, if I'm talking too much, by all means, stop me and ask questions just like that. Um, so one of the things about um, world building too is you got to think about the people that are in your world and so I have roosters in my world and they live in the outer shell those are the areas outside the egg <laughs> um, because the egg is governed by an oversaw overseen by the church so the dove who is like a priest is is the governing body of that egg and if you don't practice or follow the goddess then you can't live in the egg. So most of them live, people who don't like crows or roosters, they live in the outer shell, All right. And so how did you first come up with the idea that you wanted to use birds? And I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, once you actually started like researching, like everything kind of like came together. Mm -hmm. What was the initial thing that was like, oh, I'm gonna make this story um, about bird people? And how do they look? So um, some of them have wings and some of them do not. Um, so they're humanoids. Um, they have some of them have bird features and all like roosters instead of having like the red um, plume, it's like their hair or they have a birthmark on their face, right? That denotes them as being roosters, right? Things like that. Um, Prentice has wings. Um, and so does her condor um, partner, Galen. Galen also has wings, but not everyone does. And so, um, which gets us into some other conversations, right? Um, so crows are great at problem solving. And so one of the characters in Kill Three Birds um, lives in the outer shell, right? Because she, but she's brilliant. Like she's surrounded by silver things. Her apartment is filled with like clutter because... <laughs> Crows like to collect random things. And so that kind of behavior shows up um, in the, if, if it was a person, right? This is what it would look like. And so um, I wanted to write something fantastic, like a fantasy world, but I didn't want to use the traditional fantasy, like um, stereo, stereotypes or, or um, tropes. I didn't want to use elves. I was kind of sick of them. I didn't want to use doors. Just kind of sick of them. Um, and so I didn't want to use wolves because, oh my gosh, shifters have burnt that out. Like I just I wanted something, I wanted something right, else. <laughs> so I was just looking around going, what haven't we used? Um, and I actually like birds. So um, 
I was like, you know, that would give me variety that hasn't been done before. And then it was like, well, what would a bird be doing? And so they're humans, they're all humans, um, but they have bird-like traits. For example, my vultures, um, they, you know, vultures eat dead things that aren't cooked. They eat scraps off the road, right? So the vultures in my, uh, in the kingdom of Avis, they still eat carrion. Like they still eat dead things. They don't cook anything. They still eat things raw. Like there's a whole restaurant cafe that's just for them because Prentice is like, I can't take it, right? Because it's just so, everybody else is like, they have their own restaurant because it is full of vultures, right? Because other birds don't eat that. Um, if you think like when they go to a, a rooster bar, um, again, in the outer shell, um, the roosters have a pecking order, which is what they do, right? To establish dominance. And so they fight a lot in this bar. I think like Roadhouse, right? With Patrick Swayze. Um, but they also get like lots of scars from fighting. And so what do my, the roosters in the kingdom of Avis do? After they get, they decorate them with tattoos. Uh, the women like put rhinestones on them and yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause they're proud of them, <laughs> right? But they're always, there's like, she she comes in to like speak to the bar, to the owner about, uh, cause she's looking for her information and she's in there five seconds it's already a fight because <laughs> pecking order um <laughs> so but it's also like chicken feed all over the floor right because they don't eat meat or they can they do eat chicken i've seen chickens eat other chickens um fried chicken which is strange it, it was it was on facebook <laughs> um so but <laughs> one that they even knew what they were doing like you're Oh God, that's horrible. <laughs> right. So there's <laughs> lots of little things about their behaviors that kind of show up like that, um, that I try to incorporate into um, like the dove, uh, Balthazar as the dove and over this, the city of gold or egg, the gold egg. And he um, is the one, so Prentice can't just show up, right? They have eagles there who are like police. And so if the eagles can't resolve it, they ask, they write to the order and say, hey, we need special help. And that's when they get a hawk dispatched to their site. <clears throat> and so Prentice has been asked to come in and the dove has asked for her to come because he's got like a situation that he, the eagles can't resolve. And so the dove is like peaceful, he's calming, he's the priest of his church, right? Which means he runs the egg. He knows everybody in town, you know? So he's very, um, he doesn't raise his voice. I mean, he's very calm. Um, his voice is, has, his ability, of course, is to use his voice to calm people. And sometimes to even suggest things oh. if he pushes, right? So, um, and you see this in one of the scenes where uh, one of the <clears throat> parishioners are kind of upset with, with Prentice and he grabs the, the parishioner by the arm and kind of talks him down. Well, that's what they do. <laughs> that's what doves do. They keep the flock calm. I'm excited for it. <laughs> right? It was a blast to write. And I don't say that about everything, right? Some things are, are, are tough to write. <laughs> this one wasn't it was just I told you I wanted something fun so I actually just wrote it for me and really didn't have any intentions of publishing it I just kind of wrote it for me um and I had asked one of my friends to read it she's like oh this is really good I'm like okay I'll publish it but um it was just for me fun story for me <laughs> the ones you never think will see light of day <laughs> right <laughs> but the world building was a big part of that and I wanted you guys I think that's the thing like world building and that's what that was the epiphany for me it world building doesn't have to be labor intensive um in a boring way it could be fun and so I spent hours just looking at great art on art station that I found completely inspiring I spent a lot of time learning about birds and so uh, I mean, you should see my one note it's like full of <laughs> it's like full of stuff um but it was it doesn't have to be like bulleted list it can be very fun and i think the fact that i use videos and images that helped a lot um towards making it less monotonous 
That's what I thought. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, and just for the people out there, world building doesn't have to be that you're building a world completely from scratch. It, world building also includes making modif mm -hmm. modifications to the world in which you currently exist as well. So when people say world building, even though it's generally it's probably referring to like the stuff you see in high fantasy and sci-fi, right? But world building also includes like um, some minor edits, like if there's werewolves in your story, then mm -hmm. you have to account for that. You don't have to create a whole entire new world just to mm -hmm. house them in, but you need to explain how, why they're there, how they got there, mm -hmm. and what impact do they have on the society? Because how would that affect mm -hmm. society if vampires and werewolves actually existed? I need a Blake series. Uh, the Laurel K. Hamilton doesn't need a Blake series. Does that really well? When integrating um, showing the impact of vampires coming out mm -hmm. and living amongst human beings and other super um, natural creatures living amongst regular human beings. That was really well, this early books, it was really well done. Um, so that's a very good example of not having to create a whole new world, but looking at our now and saying, okay, what if this was to happen? What would that impact? Would they have rights? Would they be able to go into a restaurant with human beings or do they have to have a separate but equal situation that happens? Like all those things are, are right? That's world building as well. I agree, uh, Brittany, completely. I like with Sybil Lewis, I didn't, I, it's futuristic. So I just moved, <laughs> well, the United States is in a, is a bunch of territories, um, but she works in the district, which is DC. What if, right? What would futuristic DC look like when the governor or the mayor of DC is the ruling body? There's no president. There's no centralized government. Every territory has a different type of government because the United States has collapsed. And so uh, how does she get paid, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Those streets still exist um, in DC. What does the, you know, Avenue K look like now, right? Mm -hmm. What do the sectors look like? Like in Washington DC is, is built out on a grid. So that made it really easy. Um, but yeah, that was world building tool. You're absolutely right. How, if they're gonna have flying cars, how does that work? What keeps them from driving up to your boyfriend's window and make and seeing that he's cheating on you? Like what? Like how does that work? That's all world building oh, too. <laughs> yeah, all the laws and stuff that will come with it because you have to think in the context mm -hmm. of like, mm -hmm. what if it really d does exist and how does that impact everything? Really quick, yep. we do have a comment from Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. um, she says, "I have the opposite problem. I think I enjoy world building way too much. I tend to get lost in the details." LOL, that is probably from the D&D &D planning, and I'm kind of in the same boat as her because I enjoy world building like crazy. <laughs> and it is like you're descending into that rabbit hole. <laughs> right, okay, so well, you do have to surface sometimes <laughs> for air. <laughs> well, that's the question I have. As somebody who is not a world builder, because I don't spend that much time world building, mm -hmm. how, at what point do you know that you're no longer world building you're just kind of stalling like you know <laughs> that you have to write you should be writing but you're having so much fun doing this you're like girl i'll get that to that tomorrow and tomorrow <laughs> turns into six months and that's a whole 10 years girl so when do you know where that point stops for y'all i can't speak for everyone else but for me i have five areas that i need to cover um, for my world. And once I have those five, I can move on to writing the story. One of those is how is it governed? Right? What does the government look like? That's a big piece. How do people get paid? Right? Because that again, currency is important unless you're in Star Trek and currency no longer exists, which is also something you need to discuss. <laughs> um, right? <clears throat> setting and how does that work how do people live where do they live like or is it a city are they in condos are they in boroughs do they live in you know fabricated houses like the housing situation is important um and it's basically the same thing that it's like um the hierarchy of needs right mm -hmm. once i get the hierarchy of needs like explained because those are the basics food shelter right money <clears throat> And, and jobs. So once those and who who security, 
right? It's always important because no one exists without there being some sort of body that regulates to keep mm-hmm. it from going into anarchy. All right, so those are my five things. Um, food, shelter, government, um, money, and then who polices. Once I have those, I have enough to build a story. Other things may come up during the course of writing it, but those are the five things that I need to know before I start putting a story together. If I'm world building first, which I tend to do now before I dig into a story. Because it's hard once you start writing a story to pull back and be like, oh, what do they eat? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's gonna be good. So How do they eat? Like that's one, something you gotta answer that question. <laughs> what were we uh-huh. the other day, Brittany? We were talking about there was an elephant one. Oh yeah, like, the, a story they brought vegan? up. Like, ma'am, <laughs> <laughs> relax on the wonderfulness of this book. Like, no, you just want to yeah, go. Yeah, because we were those. It, they were the, so the elephant was at a um the elephant and her maid were like at the barbecue. And Brittany was like, well, how, like, why is she eating meat? And she, she's an elephant. And we were like, we didn't even think about that. Like, See? Yeah, that's she a, had a barbecue. What else is she eating? <laughs> <laughs> that will take you right, as a reader, that could take you right out the story, right? And so now you're you're out of the story. And you don't want that as a author. You want your readers to be like, oh, that makes sense, right? So my roosters don't eat meat. They eat feed, right? And so I have Prentice going in, into the kitchen on her way back to the office to talk to the owner and there are cooks back there like heating up chicken feed (laughs) in a skillet but it's little pieces of feed right so there's like it's not meat but my vultures eat raw dead meat right so that was important because that's what they do and a lot of times when Prentice is eating it's not it's fish in like greenery like she's eating a salad or she's eating a piece of fish because she's a hawk and so <clears throat> it's really important because I know people who are big bird people are going to read that book and be like, mm-hmm. Shake does not know what she's talking about. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And, and they have to eat unless you have like um, a cyborg. Like if you think about Ghost in the Shell, Bato never eats human food. He always drinks those shakes for cyborgs, right? Or synthetic food. It's important right and, and the fact that he drinks alcohol but he never gets drunk right well he can't drink real human alcohol he's thinking synthetic alcohol because he's a cyborg and so those things are important right i'm telling you someone will call you out but don't get mired too much in that because then you won't write your story and so for jacqueline at some point you'll need to surface <laughs> and actually write your story once you have those five things covered you have enough to like start writing your i didn't even think about that Cause honestly, like when I'm writing, I'm only thinking about like the main character and because normally I write from like first person. Mm-hmm. And so I only, I'm, they're basically like looking at whoever, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So it's, it's weird that I never thought about like those, those small things mm-hmm. about security. Like I know they have jobs and stuff like that, but like, I don't like go out and like research it. It's, you may not have to, right? Urban fantasy, right? Yeah. Yeah, you may not have to. Like, my Sybil Lewis series is a PI, first person. They're told from Sybil's point of view, so the reader only sees what Sybil, Sybil sees and only hears what Sybil hears. And so, um, but I, because she's a PI, right, I had to think about, okay, if she's investigating crime, like Shaft, what are the police doing? What are the regulators doing, right? Yeah. How do they view her? right is she a compete is it collaborative like that's important because she can't arrest anybody and if she keeps showing up scenes where there's a dead body (laughs) right or dead bodies (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) she might need a friend in the forest or she right so that it impacts her um so a lot of the stuff like that um like in sybil's case the job stuff like who has a it's only within that sphere of who she sees and interacts with like you said who does she interact with my people my person doesn't see doctors do they even exist in this timeline do werewolves go to the vet or do they go to a human doctor is it a hybrid doctor like do they go to other werewolves who happen to be doctors like is there a course like those are the things that don't you don't have to know right away 
but during the course of maybe telling your story, especially if it's a series, you might want to figure that out. Yeah. I had to do that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I have to do that with um, with the Bogai series. Like I wrote like the first, I wrote the first two books mm -hmm. and I kept trying to figure out like why it just didn't sit right with me, why it didn't work. And a lot of it was because I only had like small images of how it would end, mm -hmm. but I didn't know everybody's motivation and like trying to find out the motivation from everybody like put me into like actually like building the world that happened like mm -hmm. before them and the hierarchies of all of these different creatures and it was just a lot and I was like oh okay right. <laughs> this is what you mean <laughs> but it's a lot though it's but it's, it's still not something that comes natural and it's not something mm -hmm. that I would sit there <laughs> I mean I got my journals that I write it in but it's like at some point I just want to write a story and so that gets frustrating because you can't you can't write the story fully without knowing <laughs> the world, world of work. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It is. But uh, just a, I guess, quick rewind to um, the part about not having to necessarily research, needing to research um, a person's job. You don't have to, but at the same time, it can be really helpful too, mm -hmm. because like people in, especially if they've been in a profession for a really long time, have tendencies to speak in lingo. Mm -hmm. So being able to incorporate that the lingo effectively and fluently mm -hmm. can bring add another dimension to the world and the character. Mm -hmm. So and just looking at how people typically dress in that profession. Yes, your character is an individual and they can dress how they please, but typically yep. a lot of times you may see, notice, you may notice some similarities between people how, and how they dress when they're in this profession. Mm -hmm. Like if they're a techie person, do they wear black all the time? All black? <laughs> like Steve Jobs? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, or are they more like on the creative like colorful hippie side or something i mean what have you but you don't like like y'all mentioned you don't have to research a profession but it can help and help and lend like an extra dimension to your world oh it can definitely add that level of authenticity to what you're producing absolutely um jargon is important too but I write futuristic sci-fi, so sometimes I make up the jargon. <laughs> like I make up the jargon with, um, like Kingdom of Avis also make up the jargon that they, the lingo, right? Um, Prentice gets mad um, at one of the people and she was like, if you pigeons don't get it together, and it's a slur, right? It's, a, it's like calling them bastards or something, right? If you <laughs> pigeons right so she's really angry with them and so um i made up a lot of the jargon for kingdom of Davis. um but if you're writing like urban fantasy or contemporary fantasy or something that is a lot closer to our now um it would be very helpful if you did incorporate jargon even if you make it up um just know that i read a really great story by milton davis that's a cyber a cyber funk story and their slang um, was fantastic. It was completely unique to that story. It's not slang that we would use today, but I, you could recognize it as slang, but it was fantastic and unique to that world. And I thought, hot dang, I wish I would have thought of that. It was brilliant. <laughs> and so, right. So if you're, if we and we're moving into that language question, but if you can use, remember you want to maintain as much verisimilitude with your reader as possible. Because if it's too foreign, that'll knock them out the story too, right? Uh -huh. And so it's kind of like a balancing act of how much real world to incorporate and how much to stretch. Does that go for like um, different genres that you're writing in? Say, um, I figured that if you write in like high fantasy, um, of course, you would have to. You would probably have to make up some stuff, right? Make up the the language, some of the languages and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, if that, how much? How much? How much would you have to make up doing in high fantasy versus um, 
versus urban fiction? It depends. I was going to say Brittany. I don't write high <laughs> fantasy. So, um, but one of my friends, Gerald Coleman does. And I, I definitely think that it depends. You can go full Dune, <laughs> full token, token, or you create, <laughs> they both create their own languages, right? Or you can just, you know, have certain phrases that you can incorporate and have one of the characters go, oh, he said, blah, 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 blah. And then Bob says, and then your main character says, really, I can't believe you're cursing at my mother-in-law again. So that you know that that phrasing is a curse because they labeled it. So you could do that. Um, and that gives the the Dark Tower series does this really well. Um, it's called The High Speech and Low Speech, and that's by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. And so the Dark Tower series, if you didn't know, um, readers out there, the Dark Tower series uses several um words that are unique to roland's world that we don't use um he calls it the high speech and so that's how he does it he just labels it as someone would respond to it and say oh my gosh you don't have to be so rude or something like that and then you know that that phrasing is a rude phrase and that so you learn over time the phrases but it's not overly done like i said it's a balancing act it depends you can go full doom <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, I don't write high fantasy, so. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty much it. Pretty much applies the same. I mean, it really depends on the writer and how deep they want to go with it. Mm -hmm. For some, you just can use get away with a couple, mm -hmm. like she was talking about the curse words or slurs or whatever. You just might need a couple to mm -hmm. help illustrate just how nasty someone is. And whereas, again, like she mentioned, you can go full on token and create a whole new language it just it just varies because if for example if you're writing something and you need like a witty or creative slur and you don't know of anything or a curse word you can just make up one and that might be the only one that pops up and who knows mm -hmm. it might go viral if somebody finds it and they start saying it themselves like you i mean know. you've seen the witcher right mm -hmm. they didn't make up any words for him it's just one f word <laughs> so, everybody knows what that is and so he used it a lot so, <laughs> so you could just do that um but i definitely think it depends on the writer and if you're planning i think it's important if you're planning a series mm -hmm. your the more if you're planning a series of books then your world building needs to go deeper mm -hmm. because it's not a one shot right and so if you you're going to expand it out like if you're a group of characters both primary and secondary to cover multiple books um you may want to go a little deeper with your world building so what are some things that you suggest um to look for when building those characters what are some things that y'all like immediately look for and then some things that you run across um, while researching for those characters that that you would um, advise us about. Well, so I for like me, a, go, Brittany. No, go. Go ahead. No, go. <laughs> I well, don't write high you, fantasy, so Brittany, Brittany's the expert it here on just that. Include, it, just, it doesn't just include high <laughs> fantasy. It includes sci-fi and steampunk and all that jazz, too. So, But like for me, like I ran into a bit of a snag when... Um, during my first draft of one of my stories. And I realized that I did not exactly specify, at least for me, where locations were in relation mm -hmm. to each other. So it's like, oh shoot, well, how long will it take them to get here? And then how long will it take them to get mm -hmm. there? Because people will call you out on that as well. Like, well, if it took three days for them to get to this place and then the next time it'll took one day, you better have a reason why they got there that fast. <laughs> later on mm -hmm. and so and if you reference a place as being like in the west and the character is back in the same position but then you tell everybody it's in the east like what what's up with the discrepancy with like did dimension shift or something <laughs> so like <laughs> yeah, i was gonna say why did it take so long well gandalf called the eagles like that still has like tolkien fans hot like wait a minute gandalf could have called for the eagles this whole time like hot <laughs> hot so <laughs> you need to, like, you need to make sure like 
little things like that, like mm-hmm. it can really, especially if it's not something obvious, like if they have the power to do something that can solve the entire plot of the book, then why don't they use it? Um, Again, get up in the eagles. <laughs> no, I agree with that. So um, what I do for my characters is <clears throat> there are things that are character sheets uh, that you can fill out for your characters. I tend to do that um, just kind of like <laughs> Prentice, take a seat, name, you know, profession, you know, where were you born? Like, so I do like a character sheet. It's kind of like an employee application for them so that I get an idea of who they are. Um, with Kingdom of Avis, I drew a map. <laughs> and then I had um, Sir Macklin make it. So in every copy of Kill Three Birds, it's a map in the front of the Kingdom of Avis. Um, because I got tired of trying to do what Brittany said was figure out where the hell everything was and keep it straight. Um, I didn't like, I didn't want a bulleted list. So I drew really horrible on my uh, Samsung 8. And then I sent it to Sarah and said, can you make this into a real map for me? Um, and she did. And she'll do it for you too, if you want. Poor um, But yeah, she made this really great map. And so that's been uber helpful with remembering what I named cities, remembering what's a nest, remember where things are in proximity to mountains, lakes, rivers. Mm-hmm. Like it was super helpful. And of course I had her at a, at the bottom, there's like a compass. So we know what's North, South, East, West, but it was fantastically worth every penny um, because that helps me when I'm like on book two of that series and Prentice, because Prentice travels, right? She gets invited places. She gets, you know, dispatched to places. So she's not in the same egg all the time. And I needed to know in proximity where those eggs were because I could get, because I didn't want to be like, oh, she was in gold. It took like 25 minutes. It's on the other side of the map, Nicole. <laughs> That's longer than 25 minutes, especially when you're going by rail car. Oh, which is also important. <clears throat> when you're building a world, how do people get around? Yes, 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 yes. Is it a horse? Is it a carriage? Do they fly? Like in Prentice's case, um, they travel everywhere by train or by carriage. There aren't any electric cars or anything like that. They use a bird collar to make calls. <laughs> Hi. I'm loving this world building that she's like giving us. Like, I'm over here geeking out internally. Y'all just don't know. I was completely uh, geeking out already. I was like, oh my God, I can use a bird collar for a phone. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's it so gets ridiculous. Addictive. It gets addictive, man. When stuff starts like <laughs> falling into place, it's like, oh, oh, and then you can do this. And then, and then, and then. Like so what? serious. I was like, oh my gosh. Someone sent me an email and was like, oh my God, I love it. I love all the puns. Yes. Yes. And, and sometimes they're like talking cheek puns, but yeah, I love it. It was fantastic. But that's, that's another thing. Transportation. How do people get around in your world? Like in my Civil Lewis series, series, people, they're flying cars. It's basically Blade Runner, like I said. So they have flying cars. She, hers is a hoopty, right? So she's constantly like broke down, but because she never <laughs> has any money. But that's Sybil's problem. Um, but her friend, her partner dri- rides an aerocycle right and so it's a motorcycle that is, uses air to fly it's a flying cycle and so uh, how does that work what is there it's dc so is it always traffic yes because it's still dc um and so it's like <laughs> it's just dc in the future and the traffic is now in the elevated lanes and so uh, that's so important for world building too how do your people get around oh, oh. that's so crazy really quick. jacqueline oh. has Another comment. Um, I always assumed that Gandalf didn't do it because he was trying to build Frodo and Bilbo's characters. Like he didn't want to interfere with their journeys. I would have definitely called the Eagles. <laughs> Girl, yes. <laughs> Look, Frodo lost a finger. Okay. <laughs> he did the Eagles. <laughs> he was forever changed. Like he could never go back to being the way being with his people. Like that forever mm-hmm. changed him. Talk about serious, like fantastic PTSD. Like that really messed him up. He had to leave yes, Middle Earth. Yes. That was horrible. Um, that was a lesson I feel like Gandalf wasn't in a position to do, but who else was gonna do it? Yeah. Oh yeah, because he didn't trust himself, right? Hmm? Say it again. I said, yeah, that's right, because he didn't trust himself with the ring. Right. Gandalf didn't trust himself with the ring. The only I mean 
<laughs> poor Frodo. I know. <laughs> we should like pour one out for him, but okay. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you spoke of what? What was that you said earlier, Saris? Is it is that a person or is that like a um a program that you use to create worlds? The map. Yeah, the map. Uh, no, her name is Sarah uh, Macklin, okay. and she makes maps. But do you use anything else besides... Um, I drew a crude <laughs> one on my Samsung, but I mean, it was really horrible. Like, I don't have my phone on I'll show you, but it was really bad. Um, <laughs> it's like, it was terrible. I'm like, I don't know how she got the map out of the draft that I sent her because it was really atrocious, but she did. <laughs> like, we're only asking because like there are programs out there that can mm -hmm. or allows yeah. you or helps you to build maps that's mm -hmm. all, like what is it I'm about to call the wrong one just now yeah uh, I don't I'll know how you pronounce that little word little. al Alcazar Gizpub or something like that I do not know how to pronounce it but you can it generates maps for you and you can adjust the settings on it Mm -hmm. Like if you want your mountains high, low, like how how far does the coast come in? You know, rivers and all that jazz. So, and oh. it like can break up your landmass into like cultures and cities and biomes and all that jazz. So, if you want, I wanted deep. one for the book, <laughs> and I wanted it pretty. And so <laughs> she's like, so it's like one. For, I wanted it for the book as well, and it's and I wanted. I've seen other maps that she'd done, and I was like, oh my god, those are so pretty. I wanted a pretty map. Is it sarahmacklin.com? Mm -hmm. Same one? Okay, because I'm looking at her site right now. It's the same. Yeah, she just released the the Royal Heretic, which is her book. So uh, that should be her. I think there's only one. I say that, and then. <laughs> and there's like 1600 of them <laughs> it always is he has a book called a webcomic called magical girl tiffany yes okay then this is the same one then Ooh, she looks okay. really reasonable and her art's really good just as an fyi for those of y'all who are looking i loved her the map she did one for milton davis's uh fredonia series and it was that one was in color and it was brilliant and i was like i'm a map fiend like i still have paper maps mm -hmm. um of london of dc of all kinds of places because i'm a nerd and so i love maps and so when i saw her map i was like when i get extra money that's mm -hmm. not going towards book covers I'm <laughs> and so i bought a map <laughs> and it was beautiful that's nice really pretty. Well, somebody that I, um, I want to say that Patricia Briggs does it mm. and make, she makes maps or she makes like the area that she's going to, um, she's going to be talking about, um, in her books too. I mm -hmm. thought that was cool. Yeah. yeah, it helps a lot. Um, <clears throat> I debated with rather to use a glossary, excuse me. Um, some of my alpha readers were like, you need a glossary to describe what bird song is. How do they pay with bird song? I'm like, it's a currency. She literally says, here's a bird song and puts a coin in his hand. I don't think I need to go into any more detail than that. But it was a thought that sometimes your world might need a glossary if you have a lot of foreign terms that people may not recognize. Just a thought. Yes, I try to keep from doing that, especially anymore. I like compound words because I want something that's kind of unique but also easy to remember and won't mm -hmm. take the reader out of the story. Like I've read like great, wonderful, fantastic um, fantasy books and other books, but then the main character's name is not something I've seen before. I don't know how to pronounce it, and I can't be bothered to go and try to hunt down its pronunciation. So. I just have to give them a nickname while I read <laughs> so I can keep moving in the story. So I try to keep it yeah. simple. If I have a made up name, um, I try to merge like two names that are close in mm -hmm. spelling and maybe pronunciation. So yeah, because I don't, I don't want my readers to like get taken out of the story. Mm -hmm. So it may seem basic, but at least you remember it. Chances are. This is true. 
I naming to, is um, important too. Mm-hmm. I try to do, um, especially if I have like creatures or something, I try mm-hmm. to find words that are similar to um, whatever their power is or wherever they, um, wherever they originated from or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, so that you know that like Jazz mm-hmm. comes from the planet destroy or something you know what I mean mm-hmm. so it's it's to make it simple at least for me man comic books have been doing that forever so you're right on the spot <laughs> like they've been doing that forever like that's that's what they do I am Galactus I eat galaxies no duh <laughs> it works it works especially it when, does. You're, when you're writing out when you're writing a lot of them mm-hmm. You have to you have to have something like that to like stick to to stick to them to separate them. Oh yeah, I like oh, my class three girls. <laughs> 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 like the the more I have, the better. Not that I'm going to use them all, but it's just like, ooh, this would be a cool concept to use maybe later in a different story. But it's just fun, creative stuff. I do. I collect. Mm. I collect names. I like do you? I'm terrible at that. So I, I, I'm, I'm not great at names. Um, I do collect names. So when I hear unique names, I write them down. So I have like a notebook of like names that are unique, but aren't hard to pronounce uh, or names that I don't hear often um, that are like new to me. So I try to keep those. And then as I use them, I mark them out. So I don't use them 24 mm-hmm. times in 85 different stories. Um, like the two stories with Kayla. Um, so... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so naming is important. Um, in like my next story in the Kingdom of Avis um, takes place in a different egg. And so this egg is like based on Alexandria in Egypt. So it's like a university and it's a place of great learning in the Kingdom of Avis. Um, and, and this is like Prentice is going back to school because she attended university there. Um, and they're looking for a theft of the five feathered crown, which belonged to the goddess. And so um, what happened, but uh, the place, even though it's Egypt, a lot of the birds, the new birds, like night jars and ostriches are Kenyan. And so all their names are, um, and the way they behave tend to be Kenyan names. So I try to do that, um, try to pick an area. Like if I'm gonna use these birds and these birds are in a certain area, I try to keep their naming conventions within that area. Um, or I might modify it slightly um, so that it's not completely foreign to the, my American readers, but yeah. So on that note then, mm-hmm. like, and this is a question that pops up a lot mm-hmm. when it comes to world building that I've seen. So how do you go about creating cultures and avoid appropriation that includes religion actual races and stuff Mm -hmm. like that so what is your technique for avoiding that so i'm writing about birds um (laughs) so and because i already have a religion in my uh world right i don't touch anyone else's religion it's goddess worship right and so it's it, the worship of the goddess is built on like i think four pillars and it's like love trust um obedience and then i think respect is one of them and so i created that that religion no scientology here but i created the religion right and so all of the things that are in those four pillars or things that line up with that are not from existing religions per se right the only thing that could be is the organization for how the kingdom of Avis is governed is governed is like based on the Vatican structure, right? That there's a Pope, that there are Cardinals, right? That there are this, there are doves, like they're that hierarchy, but that's it. Um, one of the things I try to do is not do things like, so all of my birds in that a theft most foul are birds that take that live in Kenya. <laughs> so um, their behaviors are based on those birds, right? So I'm not making that up. That's you can go to National Geographic and find that. Am I appropriating it the same way I would with hawks and doves and other things? Yes, um, but they're animals. <clears throat> in regards to people, 
I don't use, like none of my characters are African, um, from an African country. My sons are from Ethiopia, they're adopted. And so uh, outside of me using my son as a model, there aren't very many times where I have uh, African protagonists, right? Because I don't know enough about those cultures to use that, right? To And I don't want to misrepresent it. I definitely don't want to fetishize it, so I don't use it. Now, that's Nicole speaking, right? Um, in terms of what I do to keep, my, to keep myself, like, from venturing into those waters. I just don't. Um, if I do happen to have like my, my, if I do happen to have a character that is not the same ethnicity as I am or the same religion as I am, I do what I always do at research. I read and I ask, right? And so if I wanted to use, say I wanted to have a hoodoo character, I don't do hoodoo, I'm not Haitian. Um, I don't practice that religion, I don't practice Santeria. But if I had friends that did, they would be my sensitivity readers, right? To make sure that I got that right if I wanted to use it. That's an awesome idea. Huh? Yes? That's an awesome idea. Like you have someone who's in that boat who's like, would you read over this to make sure I'm not going to be offending you or any of your people? Thank you. Right. And I think, I, I honestly think, and even still, their brand of Centuria or whatever may be completely different than someone else's brand of Centuria. And so you put that proclaimer at the front, right? That if there are errors in this, know that I have done this work with their errors, the error, you know, it lies within me. I can't be all knowing. I'm not Christ, um, but I did try and I did research and, and you put that in the acknowledgement. You see it all the time with uh, mystery writers. We like to thank the San Francisco Police Department for helping us do research. Well, can you name the people? I like to thank Sarah Jane and Bob for helping me understand the Pentecostal religion in Eastern Appalachia. Yeah, so blame these people if you get mad about how it's represented or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, but that's 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 what you do. Um, you do the best you can what you have. And then if you get called out on it, you don't get defensive about it. You say, okay, I did have three sensitivity readers who read it. They didn't find anything. I will note that going forward that this is a concern. Because you can't, because you can't be all knowing. But when someone says, you know what, y'all didn't get that right, because over here in West Tennessee, that's not how we do Pentecostal. We do this, this, and this. Well, okay. Thank you. Be appreciative of the knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. And some people get so, well, uh, my Black friend, that's how she is. <laughs> okay. Well, your Black friend A is not a monolith, nor is she the representative <laughs> for the whole damn race. So. Can we can we talk about how you how this is offensive to these number of people? Apologize and say, you know what? I did get some sensitivity readers. I, they didn't find it offensive, so I felt it was okay. I apologize that it was not okay. Next time, I'll be more sensitive, or I will get a more diverse group of sensitivity readers. Da -da 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 -da. So I don't understand why authors get defensive about it. Just take it and, and nod and write it down and make yourself a note, grow, mm -hmm. and, and move on to your next story. Maya Angela says, when you know better, do better. Well, now you know better, then do better. And that's all really you can do. That book's already in the can. It's out there in the world. <laughs> but the next book, I'm going to do better. Mm -hmm.